Thank you. What a pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, I flew out this morning from New York City to be here because of what is happening in the region. The fact that you have 600 entrepreneurs by invitation here, all of you, all of whom are doing really interesting and exciting things with an angel industry that may be acting like VCs, but is an industry. And there are many more countries that have, in theory, much larger economies that have no angel investors in here. So, if we could hit my slides, uh, let's talk about um, what we are here to talk about, which is angel investing, or as we spell it in New York. <clears throat> um, so, uh, angel investing is one way of funding a company. It's not the only way of funding a company, but it is often the first real set of cash that you will get to fund your venture. So let's do a quick show of hands. How many people here in the audience are either currently angel investors or are thinking about being an angel investor? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a good number. How many people here are entrepreneurs who are seeking angel investment or might be seeking angel investment? Raise your hand. How many entrepreneurs in the audience? Okay, good, that's most of you. How many people are neither angels nor entrepreneurs nor interested in the startup world? <laughs> good, nobody. Okay, uh, so what we're going to talk about now is the hows and whys and what's of angel investing. Um, and this is important to both classes of people here because this is based on a book that I've recently written called Angel Investing uh, that has now, and I will, I'm delighted to announce that the very first country in the world outside the U.S. to translate and publish the book has been Turkey. Uh, and that's actually from the title, from the cover of the Turkish edition. So uh, you can read it in English, you can read it in Turkish, the only two languages in which you can currently read this book. And my book is designed as a textbook, as the textbook, for professional angel investors. If you're gonna do it, how do you do it right? And so therefore, what I'm gonna try and go through in the next half hour or so is an introduction for angels, people who are currently writing checks, people who wanna write checks, and even more important, for the entrepreneurs who will take those checks. Because it's like two partners dancing, one's dancing forward, one's dancing backwards. Both entrepreneurs and angels are two sides of the coin. So everything that I'm gonna tell investors about is critically important for you to understand so that you as an entrepreneur can understand what the angel you're talking to is looking for. So the very first thing is why would anybody want to be an angel investor? And the answer is because you can make some money at it. Now angel investment is an investment and what are your alternatives? Well you can put money into a bunch of different areas. Right now in the US, if you put money in a bank account, you get 1% here, you can get 2% or even more, but it's still not gonna make you extraordinarily wealthy if, unless you start out with an enormous amount of money. So if you wanna get a larger return, you have to go into higher risk and that means equity. So if you go into the public stock markets, historically over time in a stable economy, the public markets are returning something on the order of 5% plus or minus. But if you want even higher returns and you're willing to take higher risk, you can go into hedge funds, which are hedging their returns in the public market and might aim at a 10% return. If you wanna take even more risk, you can go into private equity. Private equity can be aiming at a 15% return because they're investing in things that are not available on the public markets. If you're really not risk averse and you want a higher return, you can then invest as a limited partner, if you're an accredited investor, in a venture capital fund. And VCs invest in what they hope will be high growth companies and turn around and then try and provide a 20% return to their limited partners. So if you can get, in theory, as much as a 20% return as an LP in a venture fund doing virtually no work, why on earth would anybody want to be an angel investor? And the answer is, looking at it from a purely financial perspective, turns out that the average professionally managed angel portfolio over time can return 25% on an annualized IRR, internal rate of return, on an annualized return basis. That's quite a hefty return compared to other potential investment sources. So, how do we work it? Let's take it a very, very simple thing. So all you angels can uh, take out your pencils now and start taking notes because it's a very simple process. First, you go look in every garage and try and find guys who look like this. <clears throat> 
Um, and then when you find them, you write them a check that looks like that. And then you sort of put it in the oven and bake for a number of years. And hopefully the scruffy guys in the garage turn into this. Uh, and the company that you invested in turned into that. Uh, and you have the world's most valuable company, funded originally by angel investors. That's a picture there of Mike Markula, who was the first angel investor in Apple Computer, who did very, very, very well. But it's not only the tech giants like Apple and Microsoft that were funded by angel investors. Every single company traded publicly in the United States took some outside capital at some point before it went public. And all of these companies and many, many, many more were funded by angel investors. So let's start with some very, very basic things. When entrepreneurs look for funding, they typically will say, I'm looking for money from angels of VCs or VCs and angels, almost as one word. But they're not the same. They're quite different. Venture capitalists, in case you were wondering, are professional money managers. That's their job. They manage other people's money. And in exchange for managing that money and putting it into backing high growth companies, they get both a management fee and then they get a decent percentage of the profits generated over time. In contrast, angel investors are individual people like me and all the folks who raised their hand a few minutes ago who are what I call rich-ish people. Because if you're a really, really rich person, you don't have the time to spend doling out $25,000, $50,000 in angel investments over there. There's other things to do with your money. So angels tend to be very well-heeled, very well-off people um, who are investing their own money out of their own pockets into startup companies for an economic return and other kinds of reasons. So now, let's put angels and VCs into the overall picture of startup financing. Right? So let's take a look at, at this chart. Um, this is what is known as a semi-log graph. Um, from left to right, you see the linear sequence of a company. You have an idea, you then do a plan, either a traditional business plan or a lean uh, uh, business model canvas. You typically will prototype it, you have beta testers, you actually ship it, you have customers who are generating sales and revenues, uh, and then you turn profitable. And on the left-hand side here, on the y-axis, we have the amount of cash raised, or the amount of cash funded by different sources. But this is not a linear scale. This is actually a logarithmic scale. So this is, a hunt on, this is in US dollars, but you can uh, extrapolate. You know, if this is zero, this is 100,000 US. This is a million US, 10 times. This is 10 million, 10x, and that's 100 million. So if this were a linear scale starting at 100,000, that would go way off the top of the roof. So it's compressed so you can understand it. Now, where does the very, very first money into a startup company come from? This is an audience participation moment. Let me hear. Very first company. Very first, very first uh, money. The founders, you got it. It better come from you because if you don't put real cash into your own company, nobody else is going to put in a penny. You have to be betting not just your time and effort, but real cash, serious cash, whatever serious means to you. If you're rich, it can be a million dollars. Um, but even if you have virtually nothing, it better be a good percentage of that virtually nothing you have because it shows you're willing to bet your fungible cash on yourself. Okay, where's the second source of capital after you? Friends and family, right and some other people in there, but um, mostly friends and family. The interesting thing here is that these people are not experts in the field. They're not betting on your concept. They're not betting on your traction. They are betting on you. So friends and family are investing because they have confidence in you. They want to support you. And typically, unless you come from a very, very wealthy family, in our experience, certainly in the US, it may differ a little bit over here, um, people can generally raise in the tens of thousands of dollars from their friends, family, their extended circle. In some cases, it can be 100,000 or more, um, but it's a rare person who can't find some thousands of dollars equivalent from friends and family. But after you exhaust that, then where do you go? That's where angel investors come into play. Now, angel investors, um, whether or not they're acting like VCs, are looking at a business from a different perspective. They are looking at it from the perspective of a professional investor. They're looking at it for an economic return. 
and that means they're not betting on, on you because they like you, they're betting on you because they think you will be able to make them money, and that means they want to see something. They typically want to see not necessarily profitable revenues, but they want to at least see that you have more than an idea to start a company. And so that's why you're being asked for business plans, that's why you're being asked for some proof of concept prototypes, some traction somewhere along the line. Then there is one interesting thing that's a non-investment source of capital, and that is government grants. Now, this will depend on, on different governments, even in the US, which is a very sort of a laissez-faire capitalist country, um, there is a whole federal government program called SBIR grants, in which the federal government mandates each agency to, to provide grants to startups. Um, in Europe, there's actually quite a bit of government money floating around. So these are grants which are given to the company, provided it's doing something that the government thinks should be encouraged. So you typically wouldn't get this for a pure social network, but if it relates to any kind of science or technology or ecology or uh, anything that's a socially beneficial um, operation, you may be able to get it. But that's sort of the beginning and end of free money. Now, if you need more cash and you're a little bit more advanced as a company, now you turn to angel groups or angel networks, bands. Um, these are groups of angels collecting together voluntarily, pooling their capital, pooling their expertise, and writing larger checks. So the typical check from an angel network might be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars US, up to very, very low millions. Uh, and they are looking now at a later stage company. They are not looking as a group for a pure startup and an idea. They want to see some traction. They invest in companies that are actually on the way. And so while it may not be acting like a full VC, it's acting like a partial, very early stage VC. Because the next stage up is actually the VCs themselves. They're looking for more traction, more advanced company, and they're putting in more dollars themselves. And so VCs invest in one out of every 400 companies they see. Angels invest in one out of every 40 companies they see. So you have a much better 10 to 1 odds of getting an investment from an angel as opposed to a VC. Now, during this whole fundraising process, there's actually another source of capital, which is strategic capital. And this is coming from corporations that are investing in startups because in addition to wanting to make a return on their capital, they have an ulterior motive. They have a strategic reason for doing this. And it can be because they are looking to help their supply chain, they're looking to get additional customers, add values to their product, um, figure out what the next generation of their product will be, where their consumers are going. So strategic investors can be a very good source of capital, and they often will pay higher valuations than pure financial investors. The difference is, because they have a strategic reason, you have to be very, very sure that the reasons are aligned with where you want to go. So now the company is getting more and more and more. It's out there, it's got revenues, um, it's got receivables, it may be even profitable, and now is the first and only time you can really go to a bank. Because banks are not in the business of investing money, they're in the business of renting money. Banks will give you money, and then at the end of the year, they want that money back with interest, whatever it is, 5%, 10% interest on their money, and it doesn't matter to them if you've made a billion or lost everything. That's your problem, not theirs. So therefore, because they don't want to take risk and they don't benefit on the upside, they just want to be sure they can get their money back, which is why they will only invest in companies that have revenues at least, or ideally are profitable. And then finally, if you're all the way out to the end of the spectrum, you're now a profitable company and you're growing, maybe now and only then will you be able to go to the public markets through an initial public offering or an IPO and sell uh, on the board, sell on the stock exchange to the public. All right, so that's the overall world of finance and that's where angels fit in. So, what do these angels look like? What, what should you have? If you're somebody who's thinking about being an angel investor, here's what I would suggest that you look into your heart and say, does this describe me? So first of all, do you have a long-term view? This is not for the faint of heart. This is not a quick return. Unlike the stock exchange where you can buy a company today and sell it tomorrow morning, you can't do that as an angel investor. Instead, you are gonna be in there for years. In the United States, which is a pretty rapidly developing um, uh, and turnover economy where companies can get very big very fast, the average holding period for an angel investor is over nine years. 
That's almost a decade. And during that time, your investment is completely illiquid. So you can't get it back. If you have an urgent need to put your kid in college or for a medical expense, you just can't go to the entrepreneur and say, give me my money back. It doesn't work that way. So you have to have a very long-term view. And then, because this stuff is very risky, and it turns out that a majority of companies fail, you have to have a strong economic base. So you have to be sort of rich-ish um, to be able to afford that, and you have to be able to tolerate both economically and psychically the fact that a lot of your angel investing, no matter how good the entrepreneur sitting next to you is, no matter how promising the company, are likely to go bankrupt and lose everything. And that means that, among other things, you have to have a high tolerance for risk and accept the fact that there are going to be failures in your portfolio. There is not a single angel investor in the world who has never had a failure in his or her portfolio. And that means you need, uh, temperamentally, to be at least semi-rational and semi-even tempered. If you get off the minute you see something bad happen to a company and bad things will happen to a company, you can't go jumping up and down and shouting and screaming at your entrepreneur because that's part of the game. That means you have to have decent people skills to be able to relate to the crazy people who are the entrepreneurs uh, in whom you're investing and the even crazier people who are the other angels who are investing alongside you. And it requires discipline because this is a long-term engagement and you have to do it right. And if you do it right over the long term, you can make a lot of money or at least a very solid amount of money. But if you don't, you are doomed from day one. And that means you have to learn, learn from your mistakes, learn from conferences like this, learn from things like my book, learn from angel investing groups, learn from all of the YouTube videos and blog posts and Quora posts, if any of you read Quora. Um, there are a lot of sources of information out there. And then finally, all of you people who are angels, who want to be angels, you have to love entrepreneurs. Look at the people around you over here. Look at these lovable types. If you don't look deep into your heart and say, I want to support entrepreneurs, you shouldn't do this because this entire business rides on the back of these people who are creating the future. And you have to be in it with them psychically and mentally and for the long haul to make that work. Now, why is that? because one of the economic realities of angel investing is the minute you put your capital in, you know what happens? It begins to lose value. This is called the J-curve, well known to venture capitalists and well known to every angel investor who's been investing for a while. The minute you invest in your company and the minute you invest in more than one company, the value of your portfolio begins to drop. First of all, the company isn't making any money and you're funding salaries and you're funding expenses. And then on a portfolio basis, companies that are going to die tend to die relatively quickly. And the ones that are going to be big successes tend to take a relatively long time to become successes. So therefore, over time, the, the value of your portfolio will eventually increase, but it will start out uh, going down. Accept that psychologically. Now, for an angel, where do you find entrepreneurs? Well, hint number one, look around you. You're here at Startup Turkey, where you've got all of these entrepreneurs with really amazing companies, and that's a great source of finding companies. Joining an angel group, which has a steady source of deal flow, which puts its flag up and says, hey, we're investors, submit your plans to us. Tapping your personal networks, letting everybody know that you're looking for interesting startup companies. I've had companies referred to me by my barber, by my mother, by uh, colleagues, by all kinds of people. Business plan competitions that are held by nonprofit groups, by universities, these are, are great sources. The uh, accelerators um, that the professor mentioned that are springing up now all over not only Turkey but around the world, their demo days at the conclusion of the program, great sources for finding companies. University programs, trade shows, um, uh, meetup organizations of entrepreneurs, get involved with the community if you're an investor and you will find more deals than you can shake a stick at. All right, so now we get to the crux of it. If you're an angel, how do you make money? And conversely, if you're an entrepreneur, how do you understand how an angel thinks about making money? So this is the math part of the lecture. <clears throat> Take out your pencils. Actually, it's not quite this difficult. Um, but it does require starting out with an understanding of what the odds are based on many, many years and many, many portfolios of many, many early stage startups. What are the typical outcomes that have held true, not only in the US, but around the world in all, and there's an amazing, amazing similarity of outcomes around the world. And the answer is, no matter how spectacular the entrepreneur you're sitting next to is, no matter how great the company you're investing is, no matter how brilliant and how high growth and how they can change the entire world, 
half of them, five out of 10, are going to fail. And not just not do very well, they are going to fail completely taking your entire investment with them. Now, the good news is that's only five. So you got five left, but of the remaining five, two of them are at the end of, say, six years, just gonna return the cash you put in because it'll be an aqua hire where the staff gets hired by somebody else, or they'll sell the assets of the company, or the software will be picked up by another company. Um, well, but luckily you have three left. Well, of those three, which are gonna be your successes, you know, typically two of them are gonna return two or three times your investment. Now, if that happened to all your companies, you'd be very, very happy as an angel investor. That'd be two or three hundred percent on those, on those investments. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen on all your investments. It only happens on two or three. So now, let's go do a little bit of math. This requires about sort of sixth grade math or so um, and figure out uh, what this all means. So this is what I call the secret economics of the angels. So let's say that we have an angel investor who has perhaps $10 million US equivalent um, in assets. And let's say that they decide to devote one-tenth of that, which is about what you should do. You shouldn't put much more of your assets into these crazy risky startups than that. So one-tenth of, of your 10 million assets into startups, that means you have a million dollars now for angel investing and you should never invest it in one company. So you get it distributed over so that, that uh, 10 companies. So now you put it over 10 companies. What kind of return on investment do you have to get to make that 25% annual return? Now remember, the 25% is an annualized number. That's the IRR, internal rate of return. But the ROI is your return on investment, which is the total amount, the total multiple of the cash you put in. Now, being optimistic, let us say you're gonna have the whole, your whole portfolio show up at the end of the day within six years. Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen within six years. That's actually very optimistic. Um, as I said, it's nine years in the US, but let's be optimistic uh, and say six years. And so to get that 25% IRR that we talked about at the beginning, which is what the average of a professional angel portfolio is, you do the math and that says I have to get, therefore, 25% every year for six years, <clears throat> so I multiply out 1.25 to the sixth, and that means that, <clears throat> that at the end of the day, I need to get 3.8 times, 3.8x, standing for times, of my original investment um, at the end of the day to make that work out. So, taking that goal and running it against what actually happens in angel investing, it, math works out like this. <clears throat> Five of the companies that you invest in are gonna return zero X. Mm -hmm. Two of the companies, we said, are gonna return hopefully one X, the money you put in. And two of the companies are gonna return optimistically three times the money you're gonna put in. Now, but remember, each of those only accounts for one-tenth of your angel portfolio. So therefore, running the math out, and we see that five times zero times one-tenth of your portfolio equals zero two times one times one-tenth is 0 0.2, and the two times three x times a tenth equals 0 0.6. So now, if you add up all those returns and you subtract it from your target, it turns out that the net is three. So that means you gotta get three times your investment from that company. Three times doesn't sound too bad, it sounds like a reasonable target. The only problem is that's three times one-tenth of your portfolio. So multiplying it out, and that means that the one successful, big successful home run company in your portfolio, and that would be the entrepreneur sitting right next to each of the angels over here in the room, that one company must return 30 times your investment in six years, 30X. And now the problem is when you invest in these startup companies, we don't know which of those 10 is gonna be the 30X. So therefore, we have to model it so that every single one of those 10 can, if everything works out, if, 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 return 30x. And that's why angel investors look at high growth companies, companies that have a potential to be home runs, because every company in which we invest has to be targeting that 30x, because that's the only way, at the end of the day, we end up with a 25% IRR. And because relatively few companies do that, it now gets to be really critical 
as to how many companies you actually invest in. And so a guy named Sim Simeone did a wonderful set of Monte Carlo simulations in which he ran out all possibilities across all possible outcomes for a portfolio. And the graph looks like this. So in terms, on the left-hand side, you see here the, the uh, uh, likelihood uh, of return. And on the, across the x-axis, you see the actual return. So what's the likelihood? So, so if you take the, and then the, the, um, the color of the line there is the number of companies in the portfolio. So if you stay, um, we'll start with a 50% you know, return. What's the average, the likelihood of the median return over here? Um, from investing in different portfolio sizes, it turns out that if you invest in only five companies as an angel investor, the 50% likelihood is that you will end up with just what you put in after six years. Not really, one X return, not really worth the game. On the other hand, if you had 100 companies in your portfolio over here, you see that's where you get your logical return of multiple of 3X. That's where you get your 25% IRR. So what this says is that the more companies you invest in, up to a reasonable amount, because there's a regression to the mean after about 80 or so, uh, that that's the way you get that return. So therefore, what I suggest in my book, since I would not suggest that everybody try and do 80 or 100 companies, although I personally have, is at least 30. An angel investor who's doing this seriously should aim over time for a portfolio of roughly 30 companies. All right. So. Why do angels invest? They invest first and foremost because of the economic return, which means they have to model a 30x. But then there are a whole host of non-financial rewards and other things that factor into this. Because remember, an angel is not a venture fund. An angel is an individual person who's motivated by all kinds of things in addition to making money wanting to know what's going on. You guys are all cutting edge. Whatever you're doing, by definition, is something that hasn't been done before, and you're pushing the edge with technology applied to the world. And so if you're an angel investor, you can, by investing in a company and, and keeping track of this industry, you can see what's going on, and that can keep you mentally healthy and alive and up to date on what's, what's going on. Many, many, many angels, if not the vast majority of angel investors, are actually former entrepreneurs themselves or current entrepreneurs. And so being an angel investor is sort of the equivalent of being a grandparent. You get all the fun of grandchildren without having to change the diapers. So um, being an angel investor means you get a lot of the fun of entrepreneurship without having to actually do the, the hairy work and stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, for many of us, giving back uh, and mentoring is a really important part, seeing people like us and helping them learn from our mistakes over here. We get to hang out with really cool people, people who were themselves entrepreneurs and who are now angel investors. And then, of course, you get to try and help the world. What does that mean? Well, that means that in addition to making money, we're also trying to have an impact on the world. Now, for entrepreneurs, this doesn't mean that we're charities. So there are very, very few, if any, angels who are just giving you money because they want to help. Okay? That's not what they do. That's a charity. So if you want to go to a charity, there are people who make charitable grants, but not angel investors. Angel investors want to change the world and make money, doing good and doing well at the same time. And that's a critically important thing. You may have heard the concept of a double bottom line before, doing good and making money. There is no such thing as a double bottom line because you can't put the two of them into one equation. You cannot put an economic return and social good into a single equation. I'm sorry, no matter how much you want it to work that way, it doesn't work that way. So therefore, since you can't do a min-max on this thing, you have to optimize for one or the other. And so if you are going to be an impact investor as an angel, or if you are talking as an entrepreneur to an impact investor or somebody who says they are, it is critical to understand which is more important. Which are you? Are you a financial first investor or are you an impact first investor? Now, both of those are trying to aim for the top quartile over here, the upper right-hand quartile, um, which says that this is a company that's making a lot of money and doing good. But the difference is that an, a financial first investor says, I am optimizing for an economic return, and I have a minimum floor as to how, what good this uh, company has to do. So I will not invest in a sin-related company. I'm not going to invest in companies that grind the faces of the poor or steal you know, candy from children. Or maybe it has to do something proactively good. 
it has to, you know, um, provide light to, you know, uh, towns in Africa, or it has to, you know, cure cancer. Um, but it has to make money. So making money first, and then there's a limit as to how little good the company can do. Impact first investors go the other way. They say, my most important thing in that upper right-hand quadrant is having an, a positive impact on the world. So that's how I'll look at things first, but I have a floor. So I'm, I'm not going to do this as a charity. I have to make at least a certain return, but I'm going to optimize for doing good. So that's the difference. Figure out which one you are or which one you're talking to, because you can't be both. You can only be one. All right. Let's go to the mechanics of angel investing and the theory behind this and how does this work. And there are two different approaches to angel investing. One of them is what I call the Silicon Valley approach. Um, and you have all heard the term here, unicorns. These are these, these billion dollar plus companies. And so the way the Silicon Valley mindset works is I'm only investing in unicorns and my entire angel investing world is a unicorn hunt. I am trying to find the next Uber, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, and if it's not that, I don't care about it. So I don't care if you're going to be a good company, a solid company, a really good company. I only care if you're going to be Uber. And if you're not, then I'm going to write you off and forget about you. Now, the odds of those unicorns are tiny, 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 despite the fact of what you read in TechCrunch or you read in the blogs, they don't happen every day. There are maybe one or two a year in the world of these super duper high growth unicorns. And if you're in, that's great. And if you're not in, it's not great. And the odds are you're not going to be in. So therefore, in the Valley, the mindset is a combination of spray and pray on the one hand, or on the other hand, social proof. If um, you know, Mark Andreessen is in this, it must be a good deal. Or if um, you know, Tim Ferriss is investing, I want to be in his syndicate because he, he gets access to the good deals. So there, it's all about unicorns. The other approach is what I call the everybody else approach. And this is also known as the uh, East Coast US approach or the rational investor approach um, or the professional angel approach. And this says, don't bet on unicorns because the odds are overwhelming. You're not going to hit one. Instead, what you're looking for are what are known as gazelles. Now, a gazelle is a high growth company that is at least increasing its revenues by at least 20% over for at least four years, starting from a base of a million dollars. These are really high growth companies that are doing really well. This is not your mom and pop corner store. This is not a, uh, a, a little personal proprietorship selling widgets. This is a high growth company, 20% a year, every year from four years after a million bucks, you, you, you've hit there. And you know, it turns out that there aren't one or two of these a year. There are hundreds of thousands of these out, you know, out there. And this is where those returns come from because it, you don't have to hit a billion dollar company if you value the company as an angel investor appropriately going in. It turns, and you heard before about uh, every company here thinks they're worth at least a million dollars or 10 million in, in the US when you should be thinking about 100,000 or, or, or 200,000. Let's say you value the company at 800,000 uh, coming in, um, which is on the very high side and you take in an investment of uh, 200,000, that means the post-money valuation of your company is a million dollars, which is pretty high, I would say. But assume it's a million dollars. And remember, the angel now has to get a 30x exit. So what that means is that after six years, your company needs to be sold for $30 million US. And guess what the average sales price on an M&A merger or acquisition transaction is? It's between 20 and 40 million in the US. So therefore, 30 is right in the sweet spot. So that would say a million dollars, 30X is a 30 million outcome. On the other hand, if a company says, I'm worth at least $10 million, 30X is $300 million. And I will tell you that I have invested in well over 100 companies and I do not yet have one single $300 million unicorn out there. So therefore, if my entire philosophy was based on hunting unicorns, I'd be broke. 
But it's not, it's based on gazelles. And I've done very, very well, and my personal metrics are in line with what I showed you over here. I've had acquisitions by Amazon, Intel, Google, Kodak, um, a whole bunch of, of interesting companies. And they were all reasonable acquisitions, things in the deca millions or, or uh, you know, low hundreds of millions. Um, and you can do a very good portfolio that way. Now, let's just quickly go through some of the mistakes that angels make and then how to do it right. So here are the top 10 mistakes that new angels make. First of all, if you hear presentations in the competition, um, it will sound like every single thing you're hearing is amazing. It's a really cool, great, latest, greatest company. And so uh, for a new angel, investing in the first deal you see, <clears throat> typically not good. Because you know what? Every company here is going to sound really cool. Every company. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. They wouldn't have been invited in the first place. So sit back for a minute. If you're going to an angel group, if you're going to a conference, look at many companies so you can begin to calibrate and see what makes sense. Number two, once you find a company that looks interesting, make sure you do your diligence. Now, due diligence says you have to pay appropriate attention to uh, what you're investing in. Now, that doesn't mean take six months and, and uh, ask for 17 analyst reports. It means understand the market in which you're investing. It means understand the company's business model, what they're planning to do, understand the company's history so you know exactly what they have been doing, and check out the person to make sure that this is a straight person, the kind of person with integrity in whom you'd want to invest. That's all it is, but you should do all of that. Next, if you have to understand the market and you don't know the market in which you're investing and you're not going to spend the time to really do the due diligence, you're going to get in trouble. So therefore, if you invest outside your area of expertise, you're in trouble. That's why I don't invest in fashion deals. <clears throat> you would not want me investing in your fashion deal. Um, next, we talk about valuation. Remember, you're aiming for a 30x. And the difference between a 1 million post-money valuation and a 10 million post-money valuation for your seized agent investment is that in one case, the company needs to get to a 30 million exit. In the other case, without taking a single additional penny, the company has to get to a $300 million exit. So therefore, valuation is really important for the investor. And for you, the entrepreneur, don't go for the highest valuation you can get just because it's high. Because the things, there are all kinds of bad things that can happen from that, including a down round if the next investor comes in and says, you know, you really weren't worth that high valuation in the first place. Next, um, the you can invest in terms of a note or you can invest in terms of uh, equity, a con or con preferred stock, convertible preferred stock, or a convertible note. A convertible note is effectively a loan that will convert into preferred stock, into equity, at the next professional investment round. The problem is if you say, okay, I'm going to invest 100000 now and it will convert at the next round at whatever the next person pays or even what the next person pays with a discount, and the entrepreneur uses that money to greatly increase the value of the company, that's actually a very bad deal for the investor. And that's why all smart investors insist on a capped valuation, a capped conversion valuation, uh, if they do a convertible note. And once you put in a capped valuation, it's almost exactly the same thing as doing an equity round. So you have to agree, no matter how uncomfortable it is, investor and entrepreneur have to agree on a price up front. Um, next. You gotta have lawyers. This stuff is complicated. There are a lot of things for both sides, entrepreneurs and investors, that if you don't understand exactly what you're signing, they, you can be set up for all kinds of trouble down the road. So you know, entrepreneurs don't sign the investor's documents without a lawyer. Investors don't sign the entrepreneur's documents without a lawyer. That's why you each have to have your own lawyers. Um, next, despite every plan I've ever seen, there I have never in my entire investing career seen a company that didn't require more capital. And so therefore, if you don't reserve capital, we call it dry powder. Um, as an investor, when it comes time to ante up again, you're gonna be in a position of either being greatly diluted or uh, you know, not being able to be helpful to the company. So always make sure you have additional capital in reserve. Um, eight, we talked about having your uh, portfolio appropriately scaling. I would say, you know, 20 is the minimum if you're going to do this at all seriously. I would suggest a target of 30. Um, and the regression to the mean kicks in at about uh, 80 companies over there. Um, 
Next, as I stressed at the beginning and have all the way through, this is a long-term engagement. You are getting a partner here. There's no liquidity. You're not getting out in a hurry. This is almost like a marriage or certainly like siblinghood um, because you are becoming a partner in the business and both entrepreneur and investor should be absolutely sure that they can live with this relationship because you're going to be stuck with each other for a decade. And then finally, as an investor, you've got to be fair and straight with your entrepreneur. And, and people who are new will often drag the process out for a very, very long time um, where the, the entrepreneur loses steam, loses momentum, uh, and has trouble um, raising around. Don't do that. Try and make your diligence as fast as possible, make your decisions as quickly as possible, um, and either you know, eat or get away from the table. All right, that's the bad stuff. Now, let's end on a positive note. What's the good stuff? How do we become a good angel investor? What are best practices in angel investing? So, so here's, what, here's what I would suggest for anybody who is an angel or wants to be an angel. Number one, because this is a numbers game and a hits business, start with the top of the funnel. So you have to see a lot of companies. You have to generate deal flow at the top of your inbound funnel by coming to conferences like this, by going onto platforms like Gust, by looking at everything and everywhere you see. You can't get the good companies unless you see all the companies. Having gotten that big funnel at the top, then you have to do your diligence, get information, read the material, understand the industry, find out what the company is doing, look at their pitch deck. Don't just invest because somebody else tells you to do it. Social proof is interesting, but it's certainly not the only reason you should be investing in a company. Then, having done that, you, whatever heuristic you're using, go ahead and make a careful selection. And when you select out of this big pool, you're looking for two things. One you're looking for the company that can be a 30x. If you can't see, if the entrepreneur can't show you how that's likely to, realistically likely to happen, then you know that there's no way it's gonna happen because no entrepreneur has ever undershot their, uh, you know, overshot their numbers. So you wanna aim for at least a home run of at least 30x. But on the other hand, unless you're totally gambling, you wanna be sure that with your money, they can at least get some value going somewhere and so that even if they don't hit the 30X, they will be one of the two or three Xs. What you don't want to do typically is do a winner-take-all um, investment where it's either a, you know, a billion-dollar company or not. That's the unicorn approach, and that's not what I recommend for a rational angel investor. Having done that, you want to negotiate, and this is a negotiation. Um, just because the entrepreneur says, I'm worth 10 million, doesn't mean that's what you invest at. Entrepreneur, just because the angel says you're worth you know, 200,000, that's not what you're valued at. This is, however, a market. And so if the entrepreneur has been around talking to a dozen different angels and everybody is saying 200,000, then it doesn't matter what you think, your value in the market is 200,000. So make sure on both sides to negotiate fairly and carefully with reasonable valuation so everybody gets an upside. You want to aim for that 30x return, and that's where you're, you're, you're trying to model things that have a very high return. As an angel investor, you're a partner early on in the company, so you want to add value. You don't want to get in the way. You, that value often comes from providing leads to customers, leads to other investors, providing wise counsel. If you have domain expertise in the area, advising the entrepreneur, um, providing the, the, you, the value of your experience over time. So those angels who are become known for adding value get invited into other deals, and those who are seen as deadwood often don't. Then, when it comes time to uh, write another check, if it's an up round, in other words, if the company has done well and is now raising more money at a higher valuation, I would strongly suggest that you consider investing, even though your return on the second tranche will be less by definition than the first tranche, because you're investing at a higher valuation, that's a successful company, and you want to be part of that successful company. On the other hand, if it's a down round valuation, you've got to be very thoughtful about why are you investing. And sometimes you'll invest knowing the company is in deep trouble and is not going to succeed because you want to be a good person, but then know why you're doing it. Okay? Number eight, um, when it comes time for an exit, uh, often the angel investor can be very helpful at being a cutout between the entrepreneur and the potential acquirer. Can, you can say, oh, I, I can't take that over. I have to talk to my board first or my, my investors. Um, they can provide wisdom and context about the uh, exit. So one of your real strong ads as an investor should be helping your company get an exit. Number nine, you have to psychologically, as I said at the beginning, be prepared to have 
half or more of your investments fail. And if you can't stomach that, don't be an angel because no matter how good and how high integrity and how smart and how brilliant idea and how wonderful people your entrepreneur is, unfortunately, a large number of them are going to fail. And then finally, having done that and having made some money as an angel investor, you want to repay it back, pay it forward. You want to go in and give back to the community, give back to the next generation of angels, give back to the next generation of entrepreneurs, give back to the overall society in which you're, you're living. I flew out this morning from New York City, I'm flying back to New York City tonight, and I'm not getting paid for doing this. I am doing, this is part of my give back to all of you. That, thank you, but that, that wasn't an applause line. The, the, but but, but it, it's, if anything, it's an example. And those of you who follow me on Quora know that I've, I've written over 3,000 answers on Quora about angel investing and startup finance and venture capital and entrepreneurship because this is my way of giving back. I have been extremely lucky in my life as an entrepreneur, as an investor, life in general, and this is paying it forward. And angels, by definition, if you're being an angel investor and investing in these crazy startups, then you want to continue and you want to pay it forward. So let me leave you today with, if you can get, you can get the book, get it in Turkish, get it in English, and, and you can skip the entire thing, and I'll take you right to the last paragraph, <clears throat> which basically says, angel investing plays a vital role in launching and nurturing the businesses that will shape the world of tomorrow. Companies that will help millions of people live richer, longer, healthier, more prosperous, and more enjoyable lives, even as they build significant assets for their founders, their employees, and yes, their investors. Thank you very much. Um, it's very important for the entrepreneurs to understand the logic of angel investing. Are you interested in making investments outside your region or in Turkey? Not it, because I'm asking to, as mm -hmm. a rush for you to come up, but what will make international investors, angels, be interested in developing countries? Angel investing as not a profession, but as a serious endeavor that is carried out by a lot of people using best practices is a relatively recent thing. Um, I'm actually a third generation angel investor. My great uncle, after whom I was named, the original David Rose, was the angel investor behind the portable kidney dialysis unit, vascular stapling, hyperbaric operating chambers, desalination uh, systems. Um, and this is back in the, the mid 20th century. I think I am the world's only third generation angel investor. Yeah, most probably. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a very new thing. And historically, because it's a very high touch engagement, because you're dealing, you're betting on the person, you're betting, we call it betting the jockey, not the horse. And, you're, and, the, and you want to try and provide advice and mentorship to the company, it's very difficult historically to do this long distance. So that's why most angels historically have invested in, in things within driving distance, things they can get to for board meetings, to see the company, to talk to the entrepreneur, to have lunch, um, to kick the tires uh, as it was. Um, that's now beginning to change. With platforms like Gust, Gust has you know, over 300,000 companies in over 100 countries on the platform right now, over 50,000 angel investors. Um, it's the official platform in 26 uh, nations of, of angel investors. Um, so you're beginning to see a change. Conferences like this, which are bringing people from all over the region, not just in, in, in Turkey, um, and you're now seeing more fluid uh, flows of capital. Um, it used to be if you were an American investing outside the US, you'd have to go through a tax haven like the Cayman Islands or something, which was insane. I did it once, I would never do it again. Um, the, but the laws are changing. Um, international flows are much easier. Bitcoin, if one wants to go there, might, you know, might help change things in, in some ways. Um, so we're now beginning to see cross-border deals happening. Uh, I'm a partner in a uh, venture fund called True Global Ventures, which is a super angel fund that sp specifically invests internationally um, in, in half a dozen countries. So I've invested out of the hundred and some odd companies that I've invested in, I probably have five or six that have been outside the US. Um, you know, and increasingly, as the systems that, that make it happen and you know, are getting better, and as people's familiarity with angel investing gets more, and as you begin to have the growth of angel networks in different regions where we can co-invest. You, know, you don't want to do it for social proof, but if I can work with angels who I know here, right. who I know are investing with the same philosophy than I am, who have a whole process and a funnel and are, and are adding value to their, to their uh, companies, then I am more inclined to co-invest with them. So now we're seeing a lot of angel groups syndicating deals. Uh, so, um, so my investing is still primarily US, but uh, the world is changing. Know, 
Uh, Hakamba is here, so I also think your expertise can really help the Turkish angel groups and the government who's recently supporting the creation of angel networks and angel investors on a much higher level. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Join me in a round of applause for you.